So if you've got your Bible and you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 26. The Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hakilah, which faces Jeshimon? So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his three with his three thousand select Israelite troops to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakilah facing Jeshimon, but David stayed in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. And Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. David then asked Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Abishai, son of Zeruai, Joab's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping, because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill, some distance away. There was a wide space between them. He called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you? Who calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why don't you guard your Lord the King? Someone came to destroy your Lord the King. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men must die, because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug? What were near his head? That were near his head. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord, the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? And what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my lord, the king, listen to his servant's words. If the lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, people have done it, may they be cursed before the lord. They have driven me today from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, go serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you considered my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, David, my son. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. <laughs> 
do the ends ever justify the means? I'm sure everybody here today has been in a situation where you see the optimal outcome, maybe even a good outcome, but it appears that you must do one, two, three things that aren't quite right in order to achieve the outcome. You see the way ahead, you see your destination, but it takes you through less than helpful circumstances and choices. Well, David has been promised the kingdom. He's been promised that he will be king of Israel and will replace Saul. And we've seen now uh, in, in earlier verses, in verse, uh, sorry, in chapter 24, we see David face a temptation. God has delivered Saul into David's hand uh, in, in the cave situation in the earlier chapter. And David had a choice to make. Did he see himself take the throne then and there by killing Saul when he had the opportunity? Or does he wait upon the Lord to act? Now, in, in chapter 24, we see that, that uh, David does the right thing. David chooses to wait upon the Lord. He refuses to stretch out his hand and take Saul's life. Then we see in chapter 25, another temptation that comes David's way. David seeks to destroy Nabal. Nabal uh, is a, a very rich man, a man who has benefited greatly from David's presence in the, in the area, uh, but has treated David unfairly. Has chosen to make an enemy of David. And David, feeling like he's been crossed, feeling like he, there's been an injustice against him, decides to go and kill Nabal. You see the, the difference in, in those two chapters. He sees Saul who, who has betrayed David, has tried to kill David, and has been delivered into David's hand. And David refuses to kill God's anointed. He refuses to act in self-interest, instead choosing to trust God. And then we move forward to the Nabal situation. And Nabal, who is deserving of, of David's wrath and anger. But David is moved by the flesh. He's moved to go and deal with Nabal. And it's only through an intervention. God using Abigail, Nabal's wife, that stops David from acting in the flesh. In this chapter... Chapter 26, we see once again that Saul has been delivered into David's hands. And if you've got your Bibles opened, it will probably say in the heading of this chapter, as it does in mind, David again spares Saul's life. Now, which, what we should do is we should ask the question, what does chapter 25, the previous chapter, teach us? And more importantly, what does it teach David? Here we have again, David has an opportunity to deal with Saul. God has uh, brought a deep sleep upon the camp. The spear is right there. In fact, David doesn't even need to use the spear. Abishai, his nephew, says, let me do it. He says, I, I, won't, I won't need a second strike. Saul was lying there sleeping, thinking that his spear is in the ground next to him, not realizing how close it is to being in his head. As David and his nephew stand over him, Saul thinks he's safe, 
He's surrounded by his army, 3,000 men. And David and Abishai just walk right in, walk right up to him, and discuss whether or not to end his life. To say that God did not deliver Saul into David's hand would be a failure to understand the passage. God certainly delivered them to David. But again, David resists the temptation to act in his own self-interest by sinning to bring about a pleasing outcome. Now, the reason I opened up uh, this sermon with the question, do the ends ever justify the means? Because we believers or non-believers, people who have trusted in Christ or not, we all have times where we're tempted to do the wrong things for the right reasons. We see a pleasing outcome. We may even see it as beneficial to somebody else as well. But we think, that well, the temptation is to do the wrong thing to achieve the right thing. David was tempted to act against Nabal and do that. But twice now he's had the chance against Saul and he's refused. So the question comes, why didn't David kill Saul? It's not because David is squeamish about taking life. As as the song goes, you've heard throughout the chapters, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has tens of thousands. David is a a battle-ready soldier, a commander of Israel's armies, uh, and has been for decades. He has fought the Lord's enemies. He has killed the Lord's enemies. But he recognizes something different here. He recognizes that that God has chosen Saul to be king. It was God who put Saul in place. And it was God who promised David the kingship. And David recognizes that if, if God had chosen David, it is God's place to remove David. And he says quite clearly that this could come about in a number of ways. God could choose to act in his divine intervention or he could use a battle or let, David, let Saul grow to old age. But David recognizes one thing. David recognizes the promise that he's been given. And recognizes that that promise is from the Lord. And because it's from the Lord, it will come to pass. What David isn't worrying about is when that will come to pass. Now, he could have acted in the flesh. He could have acted in his own self-interest and thought, maybe I'll just help God along. How many of us have been in a situation where that's what we've done? We thought, well, I know what God really wants for my life. I know what God really wants to give me. Maybe I'll just help him get get to there. But that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to act sinful, to commit sins in order to bring about God's righteous plan. David instead took uh, Saul's spear and his water jug. His spear, a symbol of his kingship and authority and strength. A spear that David knew well. A spear that David himself had to dodge on a number of occasions. And and although you see that that, uh, Saul... uh, comes and gives David the my son treatment 
uh, all's forgiven, I won't harm you. We see that David isn't falling for it. Saul, who was let go by David in the earlier chapter in the cave, Saul has, has before went back in his word. So David, knowing this, chooses not to trust Saul. We see that God does give encouragement in this chapter. God has delivered Saul into David's hands again. In the earlier cha the chapter previous, God dealt with Nabal and sent Abigail. In the pr chapter previous to that, God has... That's all right, Carol. That's all right. And in the chapter previous to that, when, when Saul has, uh, David has a chance to kill Saul in the cave, again, God had delivered Saul into his hands. But discerning what the encouragement was is really important. David could have looked at these situations and thought, just as his army did, these soldiers did, and encouraged them to on multiple occasions. David, David could have looked at these situations and thought, God's laying them on a plate for me. I can destroy them, take them from the throne, take the throne myself, and Israel will come under blessing. Saul uh, isn't a good king. He's turned his back on God. But instead, David recognizes these incidents. He recognized the first one, m missed the second one, but having went through the second one with Nabal, he's now recognizing this incident. He's recognizing the encouragement is that God is in control. God is sovereign. And even in the midst of turmoil and pain and suffering, God is still in control. Now, I don't know what you're facing in your life right now. I don't know what struggles there are. I don't know the ins and outs in your personal situation. But if there's one thing I would like you to take away today, is that God is in control. And God doesn't allow tragedy and suffering and pain to come into your lives just because he gets some enjoyment out of seeing us suffer. There's, a, there's a, another reason for it. It's to help us. It's to help us to grow. If we don't depend on the Lord, it's to help us see God and cry out to him for help. When we face the struggles, he is there to help. Let's think for a minute what Saul's actions have inflicted upon David. David has been cut off from the blessing of the fellowship of God's people, of enjoying the inheritance of the covenant promise. He finds himself in exile in a foreign land that's filled with people who worship foreign gods. And he finds himself facing his own people across a battlefield. In what way could we relate to what David's going through? Well, we have blessing being a part of God's people. The blessings that we find is that we get to gather together. We get to come here through the week and, and on a Sunday and we worship together. 
we get to recognize that we're a part of God's family and that we're brothers and sisters. And we get to come and worship our our loving Savior. These are important lessons. It's not, these aren't things that that, that we're entitled to in our own right. There's the blessings that, that have been bestowed upon us. I think if we come with that understanding that this isn't something we have to do but something we get to do then we would value like David the fact that we get to come together and be God's people. David finds himself in exile. David finds himself unable to come to the temple where God's presence is. He finds himself, or come to the uh, tent of meeting where God's presence is. He finds himself unable to be in the land that God has given them. To be with the rest of his people. To enjoy the fellowship that comes with being a part of God's family. This brings David deep anguish and pain. He suffers because he can't be with other believers, other members of God's people. When we aren't here, when we miss church, when we are not in contact with each other, are we in anguish? Do we suffer? Do we long for the time when we can be together? These are questions that that we each need to ask ourselves. But it's definitely what David felt. David finds himself in the wilderness. If you are apart for God's covenant people, if we find it, I I had COVID a few weeks ago uh, and still struggling with the after effects of it. And I was away for a few weeks. I wasn't able to gather, I wasn't able to fellowship and anything else. Uh, you know, we had the Zoom prayer meeting, but again, that's not the same as being here in person. Uh, and I struggled. I struggled in my walk with Jesus. There was a definite difference in me being stuck alone. I was still trying to read my Bible every day, have my quiet time, pray. What I found is the longer I was away from God's people, the the easier it was to let these habits, these good habits, slip. So by the end of the two, three weeks, I wasn't reading my Bible every day. I was reading what I had to read. You know, uh, I still had my assignments for for college at Cornhill and everything else, and so and they said you need to read X, Y, and Z, and I was doing that. But it's not the same is reading the word of God to be close to God. How do we know God better? We know God better by reading his word, by praying to him. A saying I like is, prayer is how we speak to God, and the Bible is how God speaks to us. If we stop praying, we stop talking to God. If we stop reading his word, he stops talking to us. Or at least we stop listening. Every relationship requires communication. Or you find yourself drifting away. And as sinful human beings, we find our eye drawn elsewhere. After two or three weeks being away from my family in Christ, from fellowshipping and praising God on a Sunday, I found myself, my going to the world and what the world had to offer. David is filled with anguish at the thought of being separated from God's people, of not partaking in the inheritance of God's covenant promise. 
I have a better understanding of that now. Now, I wasn't as filled with anguish as I wish I was. I wasn't looking at it like David did. But reading this passage and studying this passage the past week, it's gave me a greater understanding of how I'm supposed to be, how it's supposed to affect me. And it's opened my eyes to the fact that it did affect me. We're, we're supposed to be together. Nobody's supposed to be a Christian on their own. It's not how God wants it to operate. David recognizes that his place is in Israel with his people. And he recognizes that it's a, an attack that's come and stopped him from being with God's people. Stopped him enjoying the inheritance that God has given him. We see that God is a God that promises things. But you better believe that God, it is a God that keeps his promises. That he fulfills his promises. When you read the Bible, read the Bible and look at the promises God has made you in his world. Understand that, that, that each of these promises, if God has made it, God will keep it. It's a sure thing. You can bet your life on it. In fact, those of us that's trusted in Christ have. We have staked our life on the fact that God's promises are true. And they are found in Christ Jesus. David recognizes that God has promised him the kingdom. That Saul will be taken care of. And that David doesn't need to act in his own self-interest in a sinful way to bring about God's plan. When we come up against these kind of decisions that we need to make, these choices in our lives, and, and they will happen, we'll, we'll be tempted to sin. We're human beings. We're surrounded by it. It's part of our old nature. The fight still goes on, even though we're Christians. There's a battle to be fought. The battle between our old nature and sin and our new nature in Christ. But we need to be very careful that we don't try and justify our sinful actions by thinking that it brings about a good outcome. I just want to read a couple of verses from this chapter. To verse 8. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. Basically saying, I won't need to strike him twice. I'll get the job done the first time. But then David's reply to Abishai, don't destroy him. Don't destroy the man who has caused me to run and hide, to leave the inheritance that I've been given by God, who's tried to kill me, who's caused me nothing but pain and suffering. Don't destroy him. Because who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David recognized that if he was to take Saul's life, he wouldn't be guiltless. He recognized that it was a sin. He was God's chosen king. And just as God had placed, David, had placed Saul on the, on the throne, it was God's timing that would take Saul from the throne. The Lord himself will strike him or his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. 
You could imagine that Abishai would be thinking, wait, wait a minute, you brought me down into an enemy camp, surrounded by 3,000 soldiers, just the two of us, and all we're leaving with is a jug and a spear. You know, he's probably thinking that he would have rather been the other guy who didn't volunteer to go down at that point. But the Lord had given David this encouragement. God gives us encouragements in our daily lives because he recognizes that there's a struggle that we face. And there's going to be times where we're going to be downhearted and and, in a really bad place. What is it Jesus said? Jesus said, basically, Jesus said, what they've done to him, do not expect any less. Basically, that's paraphrasing. I, I couldn't. I didn't have the verse on me. Look how they treated Jesus. Look what they've done to Jesus. He said, "Don't think they'll treat my followers any better. Don't expect it." But there are encouragements on the way, and ultimately, it's worth it. This life that we find ourselves in Christ. Trusting in Jesus every day, even through pain and suffering, great disappointments. Even in the midst of that, we have the encouragement and the sure knowledge that Jesus will keep his promise. That this life isn't all there is. And there is a time coming when we will be with him in eternity. And ultimately in the new creation. We sing about this. We pray about this. We read the word. And we meditate on God's promises. But if we really need to believe it. And when we believe it firmly. And in our hearts. It becomes a reality in our lives. We see God's encouragements. Sometimes we we find ourselves blind to the the encouragements. We even take them to mean a different thing than they are. It had been very easy for for David to take it as an encouragement to go and kill Saul. But thankfully he recognized that sin isn't the way to blessing. That sin is the way to curse. Keep, keep your eyes open for encouragements from the Lord. Our suffering in this life doesn't end. doesn't come to pass. There's always the next thing. There's always the battle that comes. There's always a disappointment ahead. But in between those times, there's also times of great joy and happiness. Times of great encouragement. Times when God gives us just what we need at just the right time. That's what David received when Abigail turned up on the road and said and warned him and stopped him from going through what he was going to do. That was an encouragement. It was encouragement for God that he doesn't need to achieve and attain things that God has promised. God will do that. You don't need to attain for yourself what God has already given and promised you. Keep trusting in God every day. Keep looking for the encouragements. And don't get tempted and to sin thinking that it's going to lead you to God. That it's going to lead you to that better tomorrow. It never will. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is that better tomorrow. He's our Sabbath rest. We need nothing but him. He, he's the only person that we literally cannot live without. That relationship is everything. And the wonderful promise of God is that because you didn't achieve it and it was given to you, you can't lose it. If you have trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, if you've cried out for forgiveness, you're saved. You're saved from the penalty that your sin brings. The penalty of death. Eternal death. That you're grafted into the body of Christ. You're part of God's covenant people. And you have the promise of new life. And the reality of that new life. Sin will not lead you to a better tomorrow. And David knew that. David knew that the, the kingdom wasn't waiting at the end of that spear. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we just pray and give thanks to you for everything that you have done for us, for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, without whom we have no hope. Lord, help us to hear your word and obey your word, knowing that it brings blessing and that to reject it brings curse. Lord, help us in our struggles. Help us with the pain that we feel and that we go through, the sadness that sometimes overtakes us. Help us to be loving and kind, even to those who really don't deserve our love and kindness. Recognizing that we don't deserve your love and your kindness and your grace. That just as we have rejected and despised you and turned away from you, Lord, that you didn't offer that same thing back to us, Lord. You didn't reject us. Instead, you stretched out your, your arms on the cross for a world that condemned you and hated you and despised you in order that you would bring life to the very people who are your enemy and reconcile us to our creator, our God and our Father in heaven. Lord, help us to live out these truths in our hearts. Let it not just be a knowledge that we have in our head, but Lord, let us help us that we may live it out, that we may love those who seem unlovable, to pray for those who persecute us. And Lord, offer them the same gift that is being offered to us, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us be a gospel people a people who gives the good news to all we meet and know, a people who pray for one another and for the lost, for those that don't know you. Lord, thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.